Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach, mentor coach. And what I do is I help people that are tired of who they are and where they are in life. And this is Gloria, your life coach. I help those who are feeling stuck, struggling with difficulties such as self-doubt, inner judgment, lack of confidence, life transitions, and taking steps forward. And welcome to Life's A Shuffle podcast. Now, you may wonder why it's called Life's A Shuffle. And the reason why we came up with this title was that life is really shuffling. And it doesn't matter where you come from, your background, what age you are, you're shuffling multiple things in life. And the best thing to know in life is everybody faces your struggles and everybody faces what you're going through. But there's hope in learning something about that. So when our guests share their journey, the hope is you learn something in that journey so yourself can navigate the struggles you face, the low self-esteem, the self-confidence. And that's why we call podcast Life's a Shuffle. And throughout this podcast, we share our personal overcoming stories, as well as our guests who shares their personal journey in overcoming their personal struggles. Life's a Shuffle podcast is here to connect like-minded individuals. And thank you for listening to Life's a Shuffle podcast. Hi, this is Gloria, your life coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, everyone. This is the first time I'm seeing you live. The first time you've seen us mm-hmm. live. And my name is Ronald Johnson. And welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle this is our first live video that we shot so far. <laughs> it's not 2021, so we're, we're good. And with that, we have a great special guest. He's also a life coach. And her name is Angelique Ingram. Welcome to our first live video. Life's a shuffle. How do you feel? I feel excited. I'm so nervous, but I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, for having me on. And to be the first guest, I'm very honored. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We almost forgot one thing. I see something in my camera, and there's a glass here. I think I'm going to fill it up. It's empty. Mine's already filled. No, it's filling up. There we go. It's filling up. It's filling up. (laughs) And that's about it. Where's yours, Angelique? Show us your bottle. And I'm going to take a nice sip. (laughs) It's my water. It's not vodka. (laughs) Okay. I have white. And this one is what I'm filling today. Actually, let's <laughs> take out there. I'm feeling pretty. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. And cheers. Virtual cheers. Ange- yes, virtual, virtual cheers. cheers. Okay, Welcome, I see you have a shirt on. Thank you. You got to show us what it says. Mm. Perfect. I love so, it. So because of everything that's been going on in the world in this past, well, 2020 is almost done. So... We got to embrace kindness, right? Embrace yes. mindfulness, mm-hmm. embrace empathy, mm. joy. And I don't want to go all the way up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Embrace life and most especially embrace happiness. Awesome. Actually, I think embrace life, I would say probably on top. But I think I was trying to figure this out. Why is kindness first? But I think being kind right now is what's important because of the pandemic and people are just you know just yeah. not not sure how to interact anymore with some people right now disconnected yeah. they're disconnected that's what it is yes yeah and you know what the, the when you think of kindness the first thing you says other people the first step to achieving great kindness is to be kindness to yourself mm-hmm. that's the first thing and, and, and i love this shirt but one thing is missing <clears throat> one thing that we always talk about now it wasn't a big thing a year ago two years ago Gratitude. So kind to yourself and yeah. gratitude. gratitude. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Maybe I should write it down and add it here. So I'm at the bottom. You get a Sharpie. You <laughs> oh, right here, right on the very top. Yeah, there you go. Gratitude. <laughs> Good. Get a Sharpie. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, Angelique, tell us about yourself, who you are, where you come from, and all the great stuff. Oh, okay. Well, thanks again for having me, you guys. I'm Angelique Ingram. I'm a mindfulness coach and the founder of A Mindful Journey to Freedom, where I coach expats around the world who have relocated, specifically more the expat spouses who relocate for their partner's career path. 
I'm originally from the Bay Area, San Jose, California, and I moved down to San Diego, ooh, it seems like eons ago, in 93, <laughs> and never looked back. Wow, you've been there for a while, yeah. I, I was just 10 years old, 93, just, just saying. Ew. <laughs> Get out of here. Oh God, forget those chocolate chip cookies, right? Oh. Yeah, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Just give them away. Right? I yeah. was going to make another batch. Oh. But, um, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> and then I got married and that's a whole other chapter. Um, I ended up in, in a, a divorce, um, amicable divorce, mind you. And then I met my second husband who's British and we moved over to the UK in 2008. Um, and that was a quite of a, a whirlwind for me because he had been, we were living here in San Diego and here in our home. And he had been offered a great business opportunity, but he was already overseas. So he had to be there immediately. So that left me and the dog to pack up the house in like 30 days and get overseas. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah. I was packing up the house and then we were going to rent it out while we were gone because we were going to be gone for about a year or two, two at the most, right? Well, um, so that was a bit of a stressful uh you know, experience, you know, trying to get the house started out, um, mm -hmm. getting pictures, getting it listed on the, you know, on the, for the listing, the rental listing. Um, but, you know, my, me and my chihuahua made the transition <laughs> safely. <laughs> and yeah, so it was <laughs> quite a transition. Yeah. So and that was in 2008. And then um, what was supposed to be a couple of years ended up being about a decade. So wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, on and off. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, I would travel back and forth um, to to San Jose to care for my my mother who was sick. Um, and it wasn't, you know, usually the transition went well for me in the beginning. And then toward uh, maybe about almost a year later, I started having these feelings of loneliness, um, started feeling a bit of resentment really towards my husband because you know he was traveling into the city uh, working you know his new job interacting with his colleagues and making new friends and I had yet to make my own friends you know I was in the small countryside of England um, and the social culture is very different there and so it was really hard for me to try and get myself out there and make new friends and having left my work behind in California, I just felt like there was no purpose. So these are a lot of the things that I was able to move through, through my mindfulness practice. Mind you, my illness, my autoimmune condition led me into the holistic approach in life and to my mindfulness practice. And it wasn't until I made the relocation to the UK that I really had to put that mindfulness practice into play because it was really difficult for me emotionally and mentally. So, um, you know, that's basically my story of, you know, how I, I brought in my mindfulness into my coaching and how and why I, I dedicate my coaching practice to the expat community. And it wasn't until years later after I went through my whole process with my life coach that I thought, you know, this is something that I absolutely loved. The process was just brilliant. I, I really connected with my coach and made a great friend. And I wanted to be able to help other expat women, expat wives move through their transition and, and get to overcome their emotional and mental challenges that can really surface over after a, re, you know, a relocation that we don't really anticipate. You know, we're so busy trying to get all, all the logistics done um, through the transition, moving, packing, all that stuff. And, um, you know, and especially if you, if you leave your work, you know, it's really hard to, um, to make, you know, that transition and be okay with this, this new way of life, you know, being codependent on your partner, you know, you're not able to work, no visas, all of a sudden you're, you're financially dependent on your partner, right? So that can, that can be really hard. Um, and, you know, you're, you're dealing with guilt, you know, um, there's family, you know, 7,000 miles away, guilt around that. Um, and the loneliness sometimes can really be overbearing. 
So it's really important that we stay connected to how we're feeling, you know, what our emotions are bringing us to be in terms of behavior and, and our reactions, because it did affect um, my relationship with my husband, you know, and communication would break down. And I just felt like I was in this, you know, the spiralness of all these different emotions. I just didn't know how to handle it. So, which is a reason why I reached out for outside guidance and found my coach. And I'm so grateful that I did. So that's basically, wow. yeah. And especially like, um, <clears throat> moving into a whole new different country like what you said mm -hmm. different culture um different ways I, I can't you know i can't even imagine I mean, growing up in the philippines i was younger right so it's so mm -hmm. much different now than it was before and with and how long how long was that for you until you decided i i need i need to talk to somebody uh it was about almost a year, I'd say, you know, we struggled for almost a year. Yeah. Yeah. And then I finally just woke up one day and said, right, I, I can't do this on my own. And, and my husband's not really, he's not, he understands, but he doesn't at the same time. Right. Because mm -hmm. he's in his, he's doing his thing and, you know, he's working so hard. And, um, and for me, I, I was just getting further and further and further into the negativity and the thinking patterns that just weren't serving me well so yeah it wasn't until one day I just woke up and said right I need to just find some help here I need some guidance yeah. um and so I did yeah and I'm so okay. glad that I did what was your expectations moving to a different country I uh, I was more excited about just being in a different culture and being immersed in a different way of life and you know all the the adventures that we were going yeah. to have you know all these new adventures we were going to have and just the just the opportunity to be somewhere else and and learn what how other people are living you know around the world um my expectation I really didn't have anything per se but if, I think it's just the emotional and the mental challenges that I didn't anticipate Mm -hmm. that came up that just overwhelmed me with that. So, you know, I thought things were going to be very smooth, you know, yeah. um, and that I was going to acclimate well into my new community. But once things started to settle, it started to change for me and, and it wasn't on a positive scale. So, yeah. So I think that's, that's where I learned too, or through my mindfulness practice is that, you gotta let those expectations go. Any kind of expectation of anything, you yeah. have to be open to all the possibilities, good mm -hmm. and bad, and be able to have that space where, okay, this is what's come to me. How can I turn it around? How can I, you know, um, process this in a way that serves me better? Yeah, like be open and be flexible, right? Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I heard you were. Um... <clears throat> very excited moving to a uh, different country, super excited about different culture. What was, how was that negativity really controlling you? Because obviously you got to the point where you say, I need to find somebody and find some help. Was it a, a slow creep or is this all of a sudden it's compounding? Um, I think it was a slow creep. I think it was, you know, as the days went on and on, it was hard for me to get myself out of that mindset, out of these thought patterns that were just driving me crazy in the end of the day, you know, um, you know, the judgments, the blame um, and things like that, the resentment, it just, it, it was overwhelming for me. And I knew that I was going down rather quickly at that point. So that's when I decided that, you know, I needed to, to seek the outside guidance. Wow. You know what? It's very humble and very awesome when you say to yourself, okay, I've done read the books. I've done the work. Okay. I need some help. Mm -hmm. And since you're a coach now, um, you hired a coach yourself too, when you were going through this, um, this time. Yes, I did. Is there a reason why you hired a therapist? Or sorry, a reason why you hired a coach and not a therapist? Um, well, I was actually looking for a therapist. And then when I found this gal who happened to be here in San Diego, oddly enough, and she was an expat, she had lived the expat life as well. And so uh -huh. when I found that out, it was like, okay, um, 
this woman, I mean, we connected right away on the phone, you know, cause she really got me. She really understood what I was feeling because she's been there. Yeah. Right. So, um, and she was also, she practiced her, her um, her practice was also through mindfulness. And that's what I love too most about what our work together was like. So, um, so yeah, I was looking for the therapist in the beginning, but when I found her, it was just like, okay, what's this life coach, you know, thing, but it didn't really matter. I just knew that she was going to be the one to guide me out of it, um, through our connection. And I think that's so important too. I think you really have to connect um, on a personal level with, and emotionally with the person that you're working closely with mm -hmm. and you have to have that trust. And if you have that intuition, you, you trust that intuition and that impression of that person, you know, it, it's, it makes it even more powerful, the work that you're about to embark on. So, um, I agree. So yeah. Yeah, that's so true. I agree. You have to have a certain chemistry with a person you're talking to. And not, I think not only that is also knowing that, you know, you weren't alone in that one. Someone else had already right. also gone through it. So having a right. coach that knows what it was like to be in that same mm -hmm. place as you are, um, mm -hmm. I think that really helps a lot because they understand it and they understand it without judgment. Absolutely. Yes. And that's so important as well. You want to be able to feel safe with that person um, and that you can confide in them. You can say anything yeah. without that judgment mm -hmm. or blame. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. So it, 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 listening to you right now, what, I, what I'm hearing is that you went through a traumatic experience, but it helped you find your purpose in life, which you really enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, absolutely. So how did that experience really find where you are right now or define who you are? I think... You know, I think it's really, it just brought me to a whole new awareness. You know, I was able to really tap into what makes me feel right. And, and how I, how I react onto those feelings. So, you know, as you, as you go through your mindfulness practice and it's a everyday practice, it's a lifetime practice, mm -hmm. right? We're always yeah. learning, yeah. but, um, but it, it, I'm glad that it happened because I was able to really, come out from it even that much stronger and with a whole new self-awareness with a whole new consciousness of what life is about you know and and how I can create the change and, and how to go about that you know um the way I need it to be you know and live in my own truth and you know live according to my own beliefs and values because so many of us you know we grow up to um live for others, you know, there are other beliefs that we have been conditioned by, you know, as we're growing up, you know, whether it's yeah. our family, our parents, and, and it just feels, it's just so liberating to be able yeah. to just, you know, be free and just do, do what you want, say what the things that you want to say, you know, practice mm -hmm. the things that you want to practice without the fear of being judged or without the fear of upsetting somebody or disappointing someone else, you know, um, because at the end of the day, we're all responsible for ourselves. So, yeah. So yeah. when you were able to, um, to, w when that feeling came up for you mm -hmm. of feeling liberating, happy, and just being free, when you felt that, what was that like for you? What was that feeling like for you? Oh gosh. Um, it was just a happy feeling, you know, it's just yeah. peaceful, it's just a real peaceful feeling. Um, mm -hmm. And the contentment with how things are, you know, mm -hmm. um, learning to just be with what is, you know, whether it's good or bad, you know, um, and being able to still feel the, the challenges of life, you know, 2020 has definitely done that for all mm -hmm. of us, right? I mean, we're, <laughs> we're sitting every day and yeah. something new, right, that we yeah. have to process. And yeah. we've had so much overwhelming information this year. And, you know, it, it, to be able to just sit with that and cry if you have to and yeah. scream or argue your point or whatever, that's okay. You know, it's all okay. Yeah. But learning from that, okay, learning from how our 
how we are reacting to that and how we can, you know, change what, um, what we feel might be, you know, um, wrong or, or, you know, a, a failure or whatnot. But, you know, I think it's just being able to sit with those emotions and feelings and move through them, learn from them, mm-hmm. but letting them go and, and, you know, in the yeah. end and, and moving forward. So for me, it was just really basically that freedom of being able to do that without the negative reactions and the behaviors and the, you know, the statements and everything, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. How long did it take? Cause I, I'm hearing consciousness must've had a quantum leap when you're going through this transition. Mm. How long did it take for you to really get through? Because when you're doing something new, I you know Arnold Schwarzenegger is one of my favorite bodybuilders, but he has a thing about naysayers. Naysayers means someone that says, oh, you shouldn't do that, or that doesn't make sense. You got the some mm. logical as to tell you how things should go. How was it really, you know, shaking that off and saying, you know what, this is where I want to be? Because mm-hmm. that happens I, as you go through that um, that road, it can it's very bumpy. It's a pothole or two. There's a couple of slips and falls, bumps and bruises. Mm-hmm. What did you go through as far as being able to fight that? Go through that. Oh wow, uh, through so much, really, wrong. Because especially through you know my relationships, it's just um, yeah, I'm so influenced by my older sisters. I'm the youngest of five, and oh, wow. um, yeah, and you know. It, it, so <laughs> the, the dynamics is like how do I say this? So the dynamics are so different because I'm so much younger than they are. You know, I'm 18 years younger than my oldest sister. And she was moving out of the house when I was wow. moving in. So yeah, like, <laughs> that's a big gap. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that. you know, they're all much older than I am. And so that in itself is like, okay, we butt heads on a lot of things, right? So, but I looked up to them, you know, and there's and their their perspectives on things um were just quite different and how they be you know behaved with society and just you know the judgments and, and and things like that you know the darkness I should say I guess I knew that I I was appeasing I was living to appease them to to get their approval you know and that journey Ron and Gloria was just it was just so long you know I mean yeah. I was what in my 30s I guess when I got sick and then my whole transition into my mindfulness practice is like wow you know I have so much work to do here it's hard to to stand your ground and to really live your your own truth because people don't understand that you know my sisters weren't yeah. understanding my process they weren't understanding where I was going and where I wanted to be for them it, it was like a betrayal to them. So wow. they disconnected. They disconnected from me. Wow. Uh, they had, they, they, you know, we didn't talk for a long time because, you know, it was like I was giving up on them, mm-hmm. you know, in their eyes. Yeah. Um, and that was okay. It was, it was hard. You know, this is something I worked with my coach as well, you know, um, is getting over that sadness, the feeling of the hurt and finding peace with, okay, this is just the way it needs to be right now. Mm-hmm. I'm on my own journey and I have to continue on that. And they're on their own path and they yeah. need to work through that. And so, um, mind you, a few years later, you know, one of my sisters took me out to lunch one day and she said, I noticed this peacefulness, you know, you're, this happiness around you. And I want some of that. Oh. You know, I want yeah. some of that in my life. I want, what are you doing? You know, yeah. that you're, you're finding this new piece. You know, I wasn't reacting anymore to them. I wasn't reacting to the drama anymore. Um, I was letting it go. And, and mm-hmm. that for me was liberating as well. You know, that was yeah. just like, Oh my God, I can't believe I just, you know, I didn't react. Yeah. I didn't do that. I didn't say this or that and the other thing. All right. I'm not letting that hurt get to me anymore yeah. you know and it just is you know yeah. and so they they're noticing that and that's yeah. the, you know and I love that because I want that for them you know you know the people that are closest that's to you great are yeah it's great the people closest to you cause the most harm you think your sisters oh, yeah. will celebrate with you your parents everybody will celebrate okay you're trying something new right. versus it's rejection oh well it comes down to to a couple of different <clears throat> things 
when you grow up in a family of a household of five or more, whatever it is, even, even a single um, um, child, people have shared belief systems. And what happens in your case, you got a shared belief system. So once you step down and says, well, wait a minute, I may not have the shared belief system. I may be doing something different. They're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. Where do you think you're going? You think you're gonna leave us here? No, you're <clears> not. <throat> and you can hear the egos, the puppet pride, especially if your older sister, 18 years older than you, she didn't want to say her, I guess, two cents. This way things should go. You're not doing the right thing. What about your future? What about this? What about that? Well, I'm going to die one day and I can't think about what you want me to think about, mm -hmm. about what I'm going to do. Because what you're saying right now is I'm at the verge of a quantum leap myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I think maybe I've told you before, you heard about, I grew up Joel's Witness. Mm -hmm. And my parents are Joel's Witness. They're baptized, which is like, you know, the highest thing you can get outside a few other things. And um, once I realized there was a difference between organized religion and spirituality, now I'm saying to myself, wait a minute here, because my mom is, is very helpful with adding, I can't, I call it the sugar. We get to have a conversation about something, uh, you know, when you think about going back to Keenan Hall, Keenan Hall is a reference to church, if you've ever heard about that, She's, here comes a little salt. Um, <laughs> then, do you pray? <laughs> So, man, you may be talking. Here comes the Bible scriptures. <laughs> it, it, and, and, and it's cool. At this point now, yeah. I, I got to, um, you know, because let's say I lied about something. Um, she asked me the other day, do you celebrate Christmas? And I said, no. Okay. The truth is, yeah, I, I put up a tree and I gave away presents. That's the truth. Doesn't mean I believe in Santa Claus or whatever. It's just, it just was a way for me to connect with people. Mm -hmm. but now I'm realizing I got to start just owning my power. Mm -hmm. um, just like you had to do. Um, Cause you know, mm -hmm. part of this podcast too is showing how you did it. Uh, even though you, it may be religion, in my case and yours is, is your friends, our son, friends, your, your family members, but you got to now say to yourself, wait a minute, what do I really want? Is this the world, the mm -hmm. truth? Mm -hmm. Because for so many years being Joe's witness, you're told this, the world's going to end. Don't be a part of the world. You, everybody's going to die. You got to follow God's principle. So we have this belief, like a filter, everything's mm -hmm. going to die around me. So I'm going to die anyways. And you know, we may maybe be a part of a new order. The idea is if you die now, you be part of a new order. If you survive and you're not in good things with Joe with God, you will also not be part of a new order. Hmm. But a lot more research is not done. And being part of Jewish witness growing up that way, there's only one way of looking at something. The Bible, this is the New Testament. That's the only Bible we follow. There's so many avatars and great people out there that we're really, really not looking at too. So that was kind of my tidbit on, on that. And because I'm going to have to have a conversation with my mom about that. Hey, look, you know, I, I understand what your belief is, but this is my new belief. And I can already see she's going to reject it. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I can't right. live for a life. I can only live my life. Yeah, absolutely. I think also um, a lot of the times is it's it's a culture, right? I, I'm speaking from my culture, and I think Angelique, our culture is pretty similar, very, very similar. close, very conser very conservative. So we were raised with that type of belief of you know believing in God, believing in going to church every Sunday and praying, whereas. As I got older, someone once told me, well, you don't have to go to church to pray. You know, you can pray before you go to bed, you can pray, but growing up, you have to go to church. You have to spend an hour with God and, you know, and, and just pray. And then same thing, I, I believe with your sisters, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe it's the way they were raised too, like conservatively. Mm -hmm. So they were following that, mm -hmm. that belief. And, you know, um, a lot of us like, you, maybe myself, we, we want to be called like the black sheep of the family, right? Because right. we tend to be the one that's kind of, kind of getting out of that a little bit. Yes. Because we're following our own belief. We're following our own, you know, what we feel and what we want. Like I'm, I'm the only child. So I was raised with, you know, a certain belief, obviously, but I didn't really, it didn't really take me that long to realize what I really wanted. And then, so I've always mm -hmm. been kind of out of like when the whole family was all into medical that wasn't me I'm not going to medical school <laughs> I'm not doing anything medical because Filipinos are known for being nurses or nurses. whatever <laughs> right and so my, reminds it, me of the Joe Koi Joe Koi talks about that. The his, he, and his comedy <laughs> show he did and which is really true you know like 80% of my family mem members are all in the medical field 
I'm not. And I just keep changing and changing until now, right? So I, and I totally and completely understand um, where you were coming from with, um, you know, with that, with your sisters. And I'm glad that that worked out for you guys. And that that's when they say that you kind of expect, I guess, sometimes we have a certain expectations with being, coming from a conservative culture, family that we expect our families and our loved ones to support us and understand us. But a lot of the times it's, they are the ones who kind of do not because their mind is, um, they have a, their mind is set on certain beliefs. And for right. them, it's like, this is what it should be. And this is what you should follow. When really deep down in your heart, it, you feel something different, you know, and I'm glad that you did and you followed what you felt was good for you and, you know, what your heart was telling you to do. And that's when they say those who didn't believe and maybe didn't support, they come, they come around. Full circle. Yes. Around. Yeah. Eventually. Yes, they do. Yeah, they yes. Did. And, you know, I had that same conversation wrong with my mom when I left the Catholic church. Um, you know, I was born and raised Catholic and, and, you know, I was baptized. And when it came time for me to, to make my confirmation, I just couldn't do it. It wasn't in my heart. And I just felt for me that, you know, the, the organized religion just, you know, I, I you know, I am a spiritual person, yes, but I felt like, you know, I felt like I didn't really need to, you know, confess, you know, uh, uh, the, con the idea of confession was just very, okay, that's between me and my God, you know, and, yeah. or my gods, and, and I had to let it go, I, I couldn't do it, and it was really hard for my mom, especially to take um, being so very religious and traditional religion, so, you know, that was very difficult, um, and, you know, she, it took many years for her to, to be at peace with that, to accept that, but I couldn't do something that just wasn't in my heart. I didn't want to just go through the motions just for the sake of, you know, pleasing anybody, even if it was my parents, you know? And I think later on, in, as I grew up, they respected that. They, they knew that, okay, she is, she's, you know, she's doing what she wants and, and they supported that in the end, you know? And, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, so it's, it's not an easy thing to do um, when you want to, especially when it comes to things like religion, you know, um, if, if it, I, I still have, you know, I still, I meditate and I still pray and I still do certain things, you know, along yeah. the lines with Catholic, you know, Catholicism. Um, but I also do things along the line with Buddhism, you know, and, yeah. and the Tao and everything else, you know, so I just, at the end of the day, for me, it's all about kindness and love and and that's all what all these religions talk about you know at the end of the day it's yeah. all about that one word is love yeah. and that's for other people and for yourself it's, it's all said in different ways you know for for yeah. me it's it's all the same i i will never forget that when i'm glad that you mentioned that it's all you know comes down to love and kindness and i will never forget when someone once told me oh you're Catholic, I'm Christian. I remember turning around and saying, no, we're all Christian. We're all the same. And then, you know, that person didn't like that because there was um, that gap of separation of the religion. And I'm right. glad that you mentioned that no matter yeah. what religion you are, who you are, what you, what you say you are, it all comes down to love. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. And if anything, you know, it really causes more division in my eyes and that's in my opinion but that's yeah, yeah. you know and we need to be we're all in this together you know as, as the motto has been humans. of 2020 right yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right let's see what happens in 2021 <laughs> right yeah, yeah let's bring a new motto in <laughs> yeah i have a um go ahead you can go I, was, I was gonna add one last bit on that yeah. after reading up uh, um crap what book it was but it talked about religions war religion warfare has killed more people than most plagues have killed oh yeah absolutely and people don't know that you think of uh the jews jews every religion or everything has killed more people than black plague any plague combined yes. wars over religion and wars over who's right who's wrong mm -hmm. have killed more people than every plague combined since yes. we go back to record and 
you know what, when it comes down to uh, it's one last tip on religion, you're right. It's all about peace and love. It's all about that. And why, if we're, if God is loves everybody, then why are we individual creating divisions? If that's the idea. If God loves everybody, why are you going to say he's a Catholic, he's a, he's a, he's a Mormon, he's just witness. Well, I'm just witness. That's good. Mormon's bad. But the idea is God. If that is the idea. And you should love everybody regardless of what they are. Um, but you can go ahead, Gloria, your turn. Yeah. So now I have a question. Um, so since, you know, hiring a coach and seeing a coach at that time, when did you come around and decided that, you know, this is what I want to do? Um, where you came into that, did you feel like this was your purpose and you want to, you want to share this um, with whoever's feeling or going through the same as you? When did that come around for you? Yeah, so in early on in my expat life, I was volunteering um, and that was giving me so much joy, you know, working with clinical patients and just giving my time in my new community. And during the time of my process with my coach, at the end of that to work together, she thought, you know, why don't you go into you know, something that you might want to think about is, you know, to coach yourself. And I thought, okay, you know, maybe, you know, I just never gave it another thought. And maybe three or four years later, I was um, walking through the city of London and I saw this advertisement for a, it was a coaching seminar, a two day coaching seminar it was free for the Coaching Academy of London. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know what? And it dawned on me and I remembered that conversation that I had with my coach and I thought, maybe it's a sign, you know, maybe I should just go. You know, my husband was going to be out of town. He's traveling. Yeah. So I went and I absolutely loved it. I just, just the connecting and trying to really guide people um, through their challenges. And mm -hmm. I felt, you know, I left that seminar and I thought, this is it. This is what I need to be doing. And I need to be doing it for the expat wives, the people like me out there leaving their countries, leaving their work, leaving their family and friends behind to support their partners. There's so much emotional there. There's so much mentality there that can go wrong, you know, and just as I went through and I want to be there for them. So I decided then that I was going to create my and launch my own business that year it was 2015. And I dedicated to the expat community. Nice. Congratulations. Yeah. Yes. Thank congratulations. You. <laughs> thank you, you. You mentioned a, a couple of times that you got sick. Um, do you mind exploring that a little more and see what, what you mean by sick? Were you sick with you know the flu or what happened there? Oh gosh, yeah. Um, so I was in my early 30s. I was just 32 at the time, and it was my first marriage. Um, a very tragic event happened um, with, between his parents. And I'm not going to say what that is because I'm writing my book. I'm writing a nonfiction book about this journey. <laughs> I have journey. to read it then. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you'll have to read. You okay. have to read it because it, um, it it was big for me. And the whole journey through that um, through that event really, I think, you know, the stress of it was what caused me to go into um, it, this autoimmune condition. And I was diagnosed uh, two years later with dermatomyositis. Don't ask me how to spell it. But I was gonna, okay. I'll Google <laughs> it later. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you know, it, it's amazing what stress can do to your body. And and this book that I'm writing, my uh, my nonfiction, is going to be all about that. You know, my journey through that, and the preventative care because stress is a killer, and, and it can come up and pop up in your life so many ways, no matter how old you are. So. I, have, I gradually started feeling weak. You know, I was feeling short of breath. Um, I was working in a pediatrics office at the time and I just felt something was wrong. You know, you know your body, right? And you know when, okay, you're out of, um, out of shape, you know, cause I thought, well, maybe I just need to exercise more, you know, or, but it got to the point where, okay, something here is really wrong. And then it wasn't until one day I was at work and I was cleaning up the, the front office. The kids had all the books on the floor. So I was picking them up and putting them back in the bookshelf and I couldn't get myself back up. I, I, I didn't have the strength to push myself up. And one of the nurses was walking by and noticed and she came running over. She's like, are you okay? I said, I, 
I've fallen and I can't get up. You know, it's just like, yeah. you know, I, I seriously could not get up. So she helped me up and she said, just go home, you know, and, you know, call us in the morning. So I did. And when I was driving home, it's just turning the wheel was like, oh my gosh, it took so much energy. And the pain in my arms was something that I've never really felt before. It wasn't like a muscle soreness, you know, until this day, I still can't really describe it. Um, but by the time I got home, I, I literally had to lift my, my legs out of the car. And I kind of was like walking really slow. And I, it was like, I had lost, I was losing all of my muscle mass. I was losing my muscle activity. So I went through that for four months before they diagnosed me. And I ended up in a wheelchair before then um, because I just lost all muscle activity. And so, um, yeah, so I was in the chair for almost two years, um, but they diagnosed me with the dermatomyositis. They thought it was MS at first and lupus because I had rash on my joints and then on, it appeared on my face as well. Um, but that journey was, you know, it, it was just so, it was, it was horrible. It was devastating. It was um, depressing for me, but at the same time, and um, it, it was a, a blessing that came to me because right before then I was um, on the waiting list for the PA program. I wanted to be a physician assistant. I always loved science, always wanted to be in the medical fields of somewhere. And going through this condition and being in and out of the hospitals on chemo and all these other things, crazy medications, it was, it really changed my perspective on Western medicine. Not that it's all bad, you know, of course mm -hmm. it's, it's there for us, but the whole bureaucracy of Western medicine, it just, it wasn't my thing. I, I just realized then that, okay, this is not where I really want to be. I, I don't want to do this. So as I recovered, thankfully, you know, I started um, responding well to the medications finally, and I was able to get out of my chair, which many of uh, myositis patients don't, you know, they end up staying in their chair the rest of their lives because it, you know, the, the medications just don't work well with them. Um, so I felt really blessed to get out of my chair and be able to take physical therapy on for a couple of years and start to learn how to walk again and regain my strength. Um, and it, it's, it was just, uh, it was a long journey for me. And um, it was something that led me into the holistic approach, um, alternative medicine. And I, I started taking classes just for my own personal uh, care, you know, to take better care of myself more naturally. And the school that I was going to, it was an in-person, I was going into school and um, uh, they offered the certification for holistic health practitioners. And they also did nutrition and, and uh, massage. So I decided to go for my HHP and, and help others. In, in that way. So I ended up, I got my license in 2005 and was practicing. I had a small practice here in San, San Diego and it was wonderful. So, you know, my, my condition and all of that that I went through really humbled me and it really took me to another whole level uh, and chapter of my life that I am grateful for. I'm grateful for it. Wow. Ooh. That's, wow. that's a journey. <laughs> and how long were you on the that wheelchair was again? Almost two, two years. Almost two years. Wow. Yeah. I can't imagine. I can't imagine not having to be able to use your legs. Yeah. Wow. It's, yeah. You know, it, it was really hard. I couldn't even hurt, turn my head in bed. I had no strength whatsoever. So doing things like brushing my hair, brushing my teeth, going to the bathroom, I had to have assistance 24 seven. And so, you know, my husband had, he stayed home with me like the first two months, mm -hmm. but of course, you know, we needed to pay the bill. So he had to go back to work. Um, and we needed to take on, you know, uh, nursing, you know, we had to bring in nurses, um, 
throughout the day to help me make my lunch and go, you know, do these other things, you know, go to the bathroom. And cause I literally, he, you know, my husband would get me up out of bed literally and dress me cause I couldn't dress myself. Um, there was just no strength at all. It yeah. was just crazy. And, and the pain was from head to toe 24 seven and it never stopped. Um, and, um, yeah, it, it was. And then I had dysphagia as well. So I developed, um, where I couldn't swallow my food anymore. And so I had to drink protein shakes for my breakfast, lunch, and dinner for oh. several months. There's no nutrition. So protein really, shake. Right. Oh my gosh. Those insure shakes are like, <laughs> I don't ever want to see one again. I don't ever want to see one again. I bet. <laughs> I have never tried one, but I've I have, oh, no. <laughs> I have two questions for you and they're going to be two parts. I'll ask them two questions first, then you can answer which one you choose. Um, first one I need to know from my own personal knowledge, did you have to take medication for the pain? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So the first question being, did you get addicted to medication? The second one's a little more, I think out there of what you said earlier about Western medication, Western medicine. Do you feel that you're making yourself sick from stress? That's what causes the disease to come on or was it hereditary? Okay, I'll answer both. Yes, okay. I did take pain medications, um, but I did not get addicted to them, awesome. thankfully. Awesome, awesome. okay. Um, yeah, yeah. but the medication, the pain medication that worked for me the most was the morphine. And then, and when I would go into the hospital, it was something that, oh my gosh, it's like, I never thought I'd ever have to take something like that. But when they did, it was like, oh my gosh, thank God. You know, it was just it's like heaven. Oh my gosh, it was. And I can see how people can really get addicted can to get something addicted like to that. It. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but thankfully, no, you know, I just took it when I needed it and that was it. But, um, and so the second question, um, you know, it was just, um, okay, brain fart here. What was the question? The second question. Um, <laughs> how you, your first statement is about Western medicine. Wonderful. And yeah. I, I, I want to know, do you think your condition is brought on by stress? Because sometimes, oh, right. well, actually all the time, what you experience in inside is manifest on the outside. Yeah. And so do you think you're making yourself uh, sick with stress? This reason why you brought on this, this, this disease or was it just mm -hmm. kind of a fluke? It was hereditary. hereditary. Right. Yeah. yeah. I spoke, you know, speaking with my rheumatologist on this, you know, he's like, there is, he, we don't know, you know, okay. it, it, these things can be genetic um, and hereditary. Um, but because of what had happened and occurred a couple of years prior, to my diagnosis, he thinks that it was very much stress related because he says, we all are born with these viruses, these dormant viruses that lay in our bodies, for, you know, for most of our lives and we never get sick, but our cancer cells and things mm -hmm. like that, we have these things in our bodies and they may show up and they may not. And when, but when something traumatic happens and our bodies are, you know, uh, shocked by certain things, it can trigger these particular things. And for me, he said, it was just, this is the way it manifested itself through this autoimmune condition. And that's something that he said that also was on my side because I was so young. He's like, I have never had a patient with this condition at your age. They're either over 70, 80 years old or juvenile, you know, toddlers will get this a lot. Oh, um, awesome. Nothing in the middle. Oh, then. I didn't even know. Nothing in the middle, he said. And so he actually did a case study on me because he's like, I am just surprised that you're, you're here in front of me with this at your age. You know, you're only 32 and no, no previous history of any kind of health issues or anything. So yeah, stress is a huge right. Thing, yeah. You know, when hearing your story is into my dad has had issues over, um, he passed away five years ago. We talked about this, but he had issues of, um, I guess, stress. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I would never know because he's not here to a answer this question, but he held a lot of crap inside himself and he had issues with high blood pressure, issues with stroke, this 
every time he turned around, he's having got to go to the hospital for something. Yeah. So 2007 was the marker that he had a stroke, but he couldn't recover. It just, it went downhill. He started getting Alzheimer's, dementia, and all this stuff. And, you know, mm-hmm. when you go to a doctor's office, it's like, okay, what do you got, Mr. Johnson? You got, I got high blood pressure, you have dementia, you have Alzheimer's, and you have high cholesterol. Okay, here we're going to go. We're going to start you on this medication. All right. You no, know, 90 days later, it's Dr. Matt feeling that good. Oh, okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a blood pressure medication, interacting cholesterol medication. Okay, hold on. Let's you now give you a higher dose of this and lower that dosage. Come back, doc, you know what? I think it's my dementia medication. So he's constantly pumped full of his medication. Mm-hmm. And um, I always believe my heart. Um, so what happened, um, he had a business. And I remember, I, I would make fun of him, my sister and I. And it's I now look back like, damn, you know, I should have done that. For, for first, first thing, my dad could not use the restroom. He was taking prune juice, the Pepto Bismol, um, mm. um, Maylox, or milk of magnesia, whatever it was at that time, to use the bathroom. He could not use the bathroom. It just, I mean, number two is what I'm referring to. He could not use it. So he's taking all this stuff that's to, and he started going to X Lax, right? And, and all right. this kind of mess. And, um, and he always talked about the 70s, like it's 1997, but that's talking about what happened 30 years ago. And I said one day when I was like 16, I was like, no, I think dad's caught in a time warp. Like somehow time passed, like time passed, but he got stuck. Or like he just couldn't go to the other side. Mm-hmm. And it, it came through that my dad probably didn't have enough things to unbox in his life. So all that mm-hmm. stuff was just held so much inside. It's like a cup. It's, you know, it's only 12 ounces. If you keep pouring water in, it, it flows all over the place. You can't unbox that stuff. And I will always believe this. I'll say the last thing. Sometimes in life, people are like boat anchors. As someone tied a boat anchor to you and drop you off in the Marianas Trench, which is the deepest part of the world, and drop you off, but that anchor is tied to your legs, you're going to sink. But if you get rid of that anchor, you actually breathe. And sometimes in my dad's life, he didn't get rid of people, and these people were boat anchors. They just drug him down. And um, my stepmom was one of them. She bled him dry, literally let him dry. Uh, my dad had a business, he had a home, he had a motor home, he had was very successful. And when he died in 2015, he only died with the bed sheet on his back. And that was it. He had I have no idea if he was a millionaire or had two cents a bank account. Um, I have no idea what happened to his house. I have no idea what happened to his money. I have no idea whatever happened. Um, when he mm-hmm. got six in 2007, my stepmom tried to um, change the will. So we had no will. So we had to scramble together, get the money together to pay for every, his debt, not his debt, but sorry, pay for his funeral. And listen to your story. I'm like, man, you know what? You are so fortunate because you're able to get out of it and recognize, okay, I have a choice. I can go left. I can go right, but I don't like left. But I'm going to go right and try to choose a different direction. And hearing your story made me share my story with my dad. He had a lot of different directions to choose. And his only direction in life was organized religion. His only direction in life was, okay, I got to talk to the brothers. Brothers mean like, you know, um, I have to refer to church. It's like uh, a priest or something like that. They're the they're mm-hmm. people that control the pastors. flock. Pastors, there you go. A pastor, mm-hmm. but they're imperfect too. So how are you tell me what to do? <laughs> yeah, they are. You're imperfect. Yeah, they are, right? <laughs> we're so, all humans. Uh, yeah, we're all humans. So if you don't turn the right way, you're imperfect. You're prone for mistakes. And not just yeah. that, our journeys are unique behind our journeys are unique. So if we sit here and tell someone else their journey is wrong, like your sister telling you your journey is wrong, in reality, you don't know what's right because your journey is different right. than mine. Yeah. And uh, I learned a new yeah. word. It's called paradigm blindness. I don't know if you ever looked it up, but it's mm-hmm. really the perception of life we give on our own personal journey. So mm-hmm. you know, I think he would still be alive today if he would have got rid of stress. It's permanent telling the story. He was got rid of stress. Mm-hmm. Stress has killed him. He couldn't eat. Yes. He's sticking in a pet. It's yes. just killed him. And in Cartelli's book, the one he referred me to, you know, even in Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, he had one whole chapter talking about how stress is making people sick. Mm-hmm. It's literally mm-hmm. activating these cells that were dormant or were do- what is they dormant, but it takes a, a death mm-hmm. in the family. It takes financial crisis, whatever triggers it, boom, next you know, you're just sick. Mm-hmm. Stress can definitely make somebody sick. It, it can kill somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, that's where you end up having high blood pressure. Yeah. That's when all the kinds of stuff start, starts happening to you right. and, you know, depression. And then next thing you know, there's people, you know, they're just, they they feel they feel like people who go through so up oh, did she freeze oops 
Yeah, she did. I think she froze. Either her she lost she the laptop did. or her oh, internet. No. Oh man, it was so oh, good. No. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep talking. Maybe she'll, she'll be able to log back in. Yeah, she'll come back in. She'll come um, back in. But, but yeah, you, you know, stress is, is a major thing in everyone's lives. And especially this year. I mean, looking at, you know, what we're all going through right now. I mean, and the the statistics how they keep rising around suicides and depression and mental health issues you know is so important to try and stay back in tune mm-hmm. um within and being able to process your own emotions and not worry about other people's and and, and taking that energy on yourself because you can only t- you're trying to process your own stuff right and then you're taking on the energy of the people around you um, you know, that could be even more powerful, you know, and yeah, it, it could all lead to sickness, you know, illness. And it's just, um, it's a powerful thing. It's, very it's powerful. very powerful. And you know what I read a long time ago, it's the meaning of gift of stress too. Stress means nothing has to worry, but we give a lot of power. It's almost powering yeah. us more than anything else. So it's as you know what nowadays mm-hmm. I really focus on what can make me happy and really cushion that stress yeah. because recently my sister was a director of a company. It was so stressful for her. She just walked away from her job. Just said I put my two or three week notice in and it's walked away because mm-hmm. it, she noticed that she was angry all the time. She noticed that herself was she's being she got she got sick two weeks ago because mm-hmm. so stressed out she got the flu, not COVID. Right. So that's that's what happened there and. That's really, really the issue with stress. And mm-hmm. man, mm-hmm. boy, okay. it, it can kill you. I know you're back on. Back. <laughs> you're going to kill me. You're going to kill me. You didn't <laughs> remind me. My, my computer was unplugged. <laughs> uh oh. Uh, you know what? You know That's what? why I have a desktop because it's always plugged in. I forget about the battery. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I was like, shoot. I was learning like, from wrong. <laughs> I, I was getting into it. You know what I was saying? I was like, uh, what just happened? And the first thing I, I thought was, damn it, I know what it was. But this is the beauty of like being able to jump back on. <laughs> like exactly. Kind of exactly. This is real life, folks. It's real, real life. life. It, it, really does, it really does it really does happen. Zoom life. You know? yep. <laughs> exactly. It really does happen. So um, anyways that was it. I forgot where I was, but I think we were talking about stress and, you know, right. what, and um, how it affects your body. And, and I mean, you're a perfect example of that, what had happened to you. Um, I know some people who, um, like what Ron's, um, Ron, you're saying about your dad, who probably just kept everything in, um, but some will react to it differently. You know, I've had an old classmate who ended up just killing himself. No one ever knew he was going through a certain thing you know, or, or whatever he was going through, right? And he just, you know, he just decided uh, probably one day just decided I can't stand this anymore. I can't stand the stress, but who thought or who would have known he had something that he was going through? Just heard one day he was, he was gone, like he took his own life, right? And so some people will react to it differently and some people will have that, you know, not many, not many people will have the type of awareness that you did, Angelique, that you knew you didn't want to be there and you had to get up. And just do something about it. I always call it like if I go through certain things in my life, you know, whether it be small or big, I always tell myself I need to snap out of this. And I know I give myself a moment and a minute to just kind of let it sink in. Um, And then after that, I I never, since with this whole new awareness, I never let myself go through it so much more, like any longer than, you know, a, a day or two. But I know I need to get out of it and snap out of that. But um, I do have a question now. So after being in, in, um, on the chair for almost two years um, and recovering and all that, and then one day, you know, you were able to get up and start walking again. Um, what was the recovery like for you? Oh, that was tough. Um, wow. That was really emotional for me. I, re- I remember vividly like it was yesterday when my husband had taken me to my first day of physical therapy mm-hmm. and I go in um, I had a really great therapist. His name was Mark and he rolls me in and he says, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to start with these, you know, five pound weights and we're going to start rebuilding your strength. I couldn't lift it. 
And he's like, okay, let's go down to three. Let's go down to three. Okay. Couldn't lift that one either. And I started to cry. Yeah. And he was just, he couldn't believe that I, I didn't have the strength to even pick up a three pound weight, you know? And I don't think he really, he, he didn't really know what was coming, you know, with my condition, cause he's never worked with anybody with that before. So he was really shocked and he said, okay, we're just going to take a breath here. He's like, we're going to call this a day. He's like, I'm going to go do my research. I'm going to go do my homework. And when you come back, we're going to get to work. Okay. So, you know, uh, that was really hard for me, but you know, from that point on, it was a very slow process, very yeah. slow because I really had to start from nothing, you yeah. know, and it was, it was long. And even after the two years, of course, you know, with insurance, you're, you're two years, you're only allowed two years of physical therapy, yeah. but by then I had enough strength to where I could go, um, to the gym you know, and continue yeah. my, my, um, therapy there on my own. Um, and I actually did, they had these gems called curves. It was for women only. <laughs> I, I was remember all. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to go to curves. So, that. and it's like a circuit, it's a circuit training, yeah. but it's all, um, resistant training too. So that was perfect mm -hmm. for me because, you know, I could only do what I could do. I couldn't lift, you know, any, you know, weight training was just out of the you know, picture for me. So it was perfect, you know, and I did that and um, continue on. I'm still not a hundred percent, you know, I still can't really like, do a sprint or anything like that, but uh, um, unless okay. maybe I was telling my husband the other day, I said, maybe unless a lion was like after me, I could yeah. probably whip out yeah. a real quick That's sprint. <laughs> That's one way to test yourself if you can. I <laughs> said, so if something was chasing me, okay, I could probably do yeah. a sprint. Yeah. but it wouldn't last very long. <laughs> so yeah, That's it was a long process, but, um, you know, as you see me here, you know, I've just been so blessed and grateful that I've, I've come out from that and to remission still and yeah. doing great. Yeah. Amy Tail, you look so wonderful. Know, you look great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> like Thank you. Moving and. You know, and, and that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. And that's really brings us to another point where, you know, you never know what someone has gone through. You never know what people no. are going through because even when I was sick, I still looked okay on the outside, you know, because it's yeah. an internal condition. People right. can't feel your pain. People can't feel your, you know, you can't eat or whatnot, but you know, so I had many looks, you know, because my doctor had given me a temporary handicap placard so my husband could park, you know, when we go to the store or whatever, because I couldn't, you know, before I was in the chair or even when I was in the chair, you know, yeah. it was just a temporary thing. But people would look at me like, what are you doing parking in there? You look fine, you know, and I would get comments, um, even from people at work, you know, I they thought that. that I was milking yeah. it, yeah. milking it. And it, it, so that was another lesson that I was learning through this whole process was that okay people with you know they they kind of shaft what they don't understand mm -hmm. you know it, until it's, it happens to them or until it affects them they can't really try and understand um what someone's going through yeah. and the judgments and, the, and all that stuff yeah. you know it is just it was just profound for me and so that was another lesson that I was able to um, move through, you yeah. know, during, during my sickness. And that's why we say you can't really judge a book by its cover that's because right. what you see from the outside is not exactly what's inside. And a lot of the times if you're going through something and it, you, know, you don't really want to show it, you know, because you want to have a certain feeling of like, oh, I'm happy. You want to go out and get some fresh air you, you don't want to look like you're, you're just, you know, you're miserable. Mm -hmm. You're out there because you want to be happy, but deep down, you know, you, somebody could be dying deep down and we don't know that. Right. Hearing, hearing you and how people judge you, wrote you off, it makes you infuriating right now. <clears throat> I'll tell you why infuriating. Yeah. Is this is the reason why I'm going to become a motivational speaker. I'm doing this podcast, life coach is that our ego is faced with uh, a one side of power and know what it knows when it doesn't know nothing. So, oh, Angelix looks great. She's milking the clock. She's trying to stay at home. She, you know, all these things that you're hearing behind your back, 
not one person says, hey, you know, I see, is everything okay? Mm -hmm. We don't take the curiosity approach where I write things off because we think we know and we don't know jack shit about anything because right. we cannot live in those shoes. So that's what makes me infuriating is that here they're writing you off. Anybody would not say, hey, hi, yeah, I want to be in a wheelchair for two years. Sign me up. Yeah. Hey, I want to not be able to go to the gym and lift two pounds. Hey, sign me up. Nobody wants to be yeah. signed up for that. So right. why are you going to judge someone else for what they're going through without asking curiosity question? Or, hey, how, how are you doing? I see you walking a little slow. Or I see your handicap plaque. Is everything okay? You need some help. Then it'll open up a different conversation. Instead, of people look, oh, she's nothing's wrong with her. She's fine. No, I was a victim of that. Sorry. I was a person that judge. We all probably have done this one person at one time oh, in our yeah. life. We see someone parked in handicap. They have brand new Mercedes mm -hmm. Benz or BMW. We see him get out the car, but like, that guy has so much money or he has so much money. What the hell are you doing handicap? They drive a brand new Bentley. What the hell? Mm -hmm. all, but we don't know what they're going through. Maybe he has had that Bentley for 10, 15 years, but it looks yeah. brand new because he's parked in the garage. We just don't know, but we right. create we all know. this BS in our mind. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's just really where human beings are missing is that one key element is just compassion. But it's curiosity. part of, you know, I, I can't, I, I'd like to say that that's part of our nature too, is to, to judge, you know, I'm guilty of judging, but you know, like Angelique and like us three here, we've learned our lesson. Um, we have such, we have a different awareness now. And, you know, with, with the whole handicap thing, I was judging people. <laughs> so I was doing the same thing. They're parking the handicap and I would look at them until like her, I did experience that for a little bit when I tore my ACL because I couldn't walk. And I was, you know, I had a knee brace from my thigh down to my, my ankle and it was locked. So I had to, you know, get out and I said, now I know why. And then even going through that recovery without the knee brace, I would still park in the handicap and I would get that look from people, oh, yeah. you know, I would get, and I felt like getting out of the car, uh, do I have to start, should I start limping so that they know I'm, <laughs> I'm hurt? <laughs> like I have to park here because I can't walk or should I just walk straight? But I do, I will never forget when I went to the mall with my mom, I parked in the handicap and there was a guy who was parked in front of me who literally was staring at me from when I parked and when I got out of the car and I walked away with my mom, he was just looking, looking, like looking at me like, wow. you know, he's giving me this yeah. certain look like, why is she parked here? She's not handicapped. Yeah. But it could, what if it's not me? What if it's my mom? She has heart problems, right? What if, you know, we have a handicap <clears> because of her? And, you know, and also going back to your story of being in a wheelchair, I've, um, when, so I had, I, I can't say I know what it feels like. And I know, you know, what you went through. Because when I tore my rotator cuff, I had a, um, I, had, I had to get that fixed and I got a surgery. And then about a little, about a year and a half later than I tore in my, um, my ACL. I never got surgery for that. But I remember for almost um, for eight months with my with um, one arm, one hand, <laughs> I'm left handed. So my I tore my rotator cuff on my left hand, and I had to learn to do a lot of things on my right hand, which was very, very hard. And I it was it was hard. And then my left leg was out for um, almost two months. And I remember asking myself, what would I wonder what would be better? having one leg or having one arm. And I remember mm -hmm. asking myself that question because I said, I, I don't know, you know, what it would be like, because for me, I'm left-handed. I have really had a hard time with my right. I had to learn everything with my right. And even just putting my hair up, I had to have my boys like put my hair up for me sometimes mm -hmm. because, you know, I want my hair up. <laughs> it's just <laughs> always on my face. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, and until... One day, um, so I do U Jam, and I saw so U Jam is a fitness. <laughs> you know what that is, and until one day there was a special um, U Jam session. I think it was like a ninety minute one, and there was a lot of instructors. And I remember looking through the very front of the gym, and there was a lady in a wheelchair. She was U Jamming in a wheelchair. Wow. I mean, like she was moving her wheelchairs and you know what? I That's cried. amazing. <laughs> I really did. I cried when I saw her and I couldn't wait till the end of the class to talk to her, how she inspired me because here I was complaining, you know, God, I hated having to use only one leg working or 
I can't do a lot of things I couldn't do because I went to like at least a couple of months of depression because I said, I'm done. I can't play volleyball anymore. But with you, um, what I can relate to is that what I felt with you is that you were, you stayed strong here and you straight stayed strong here. I think that's what kept you going and you were determined to get out of that chair and just continue living your life and even better. Mm. I tried, you know, it, there were many dark days for me, but, you know, um, it, it wasn't easy, you know, and I tried to really stay positive and uh, keep the hope, you know, keep, hold on to that hope that I can get out of the chair and, um, and respond to the medication, get back to a somewhat normal life. But there were so many dark days when I, I just didn't know, you know, you, you don't know the, the, the uncertainty, uh, you know, it, it, the fear, um, it, it all comes down, you know, but that's okay. And it's like all these little things that life throws at us, you know, yeah. like your, your hand and, and, and everything is, there are little messages that are showing us, okay, get in touch with yourself, yeah. you know, change your consciousness, change your self-awareness, be more aware of your body, be more aware of compassion to others, you know, um, there are all these little messages that, you know, the universe is throwing at us that we, that we sometimes ignore, you know, we go on judging or we go on blaming and, and yeah, we still do that. Sometimes we're human, right? I mean, and yeah. it's a conditioning. It, it's not in our nature. I think it's, it's more of a condition that as we grow, because when children, you know, babies are born, that it's all love, you know, and these, and young kids are, you know, innately in their power, they just do what they want to do, right? And they don't care the consequences, they just do it. And then as we grow older, it's like, we are conditioned to think this and believe that and look like this and feel like that, you know, because someone else feels that or, you know, what the society is telling us and what we see in our TVs and, and around us, you know, so it's, it's really important, you know, that we listen to these little messages that life's throwing at us, whether it's an illness or, you know, um, whatever it is, you know, um, it, it's, it's a message. You take yeah. it on as a message. And, and, you know, and as we all know that those are the things that will come up and sometimes we can't, we can't help but think the negative sometimes, you mm -hmm. know, that those darkness that comes to mind sometimes. But what, besides that, what kept you strong to keep going into just recovery just wanting to live again you know wanting yeah. to get out and wanting to you know play tennis again you know if that was even possible you know or just being able to walk honestly it's just being able to take a shower by myself okay I brush yeah. my own hair um go to the bathroom my, my, I mean all these little things that we take for granted right being able to get out of bed and get dressed uh, yeah. simple right yeah until one day you can't do that and you know and you're just blown away like what is happening here so you know it, it really is and until until you get a glimpse of that or what that feels like or you know go through it yourself it's like it's hard to understand that okay, yeah, we're taking these little things for granted. You're, we're, we're sweating the small stuff in life. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're worried about all these other little things. <laughs> it's that so are, true. You know, it doesn't yeah. even matter. It does not matter. Be grateful for the bed that supports you, the roof over your head and, and you know, the car that takes you to where you want to go or whatever, yeah. you know, it's yeah. just done. Because there's someone out there in the world that wished they had what you had. Right. They wish mm. they had a bed to sleep on. They wish they had food in their stomach. So be grateful for every single thing, regardless, because someone out there wish they had that. And so yeah. they're dumb. Or that they have legs. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I just read this book and it's just an amazing book. Um, and my husband, when um, there was a book signing um, at the restaurant and he got this book for me, it's called Gone. And it's about a woman um, here in San Diego, she's a, a science, uh, scientific researcher here at UCSD, was on a vacation in Germany with her family and um, her their car that they had, were driving around town in was stalled on the train tracks. Train was coming um, and she ended up losing 
both legs and an arm. Oh and God. so this is her journey. The book is just amazing. And it just touched my heart because I knew some of the things that she was talking about and describing, it's like, oh my God, it took me back to when I was not, you know, when I was unwell and, and I was going through so much pain and the emotional, the mentality of, of that journey of, for her was just amazing. But her persistence and her perseverance of, you know, wanting to still live her life the way, you know, in a new way, in her new normal, you know, and with her husband by her side, you know, and she was so worried that he was going to leave her, you know, the first thing that she said when, when she woke up from her surgeries to her husband was, um, you know, I'm okay if you want to leave. And he's like, if you can do this, I can do this. Amazing. She love. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. wow. And that goes to another thing, you know, the support. You, you really learn who your friends are when support things like these yeah. happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the support system is so important. I, I couldn't have gone through it without everybody. You know, my ex-husband was wonderful. He did every, he was my voice. He was my everything. And, and the people that, you know, stood by me, all my friends that came over to make me lunch and you know, um, the doctors that helped us pay for the home nurses that I worked for, they, oh, wow. you know, helped us financially as well. I mean, it's just so many blessings started coming out, you know, yeah. and it was really, you know, in that way, special. Do you trust the process also? Trust yes. Yeah. Where you should be at the right time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So about your coaching business, um, <laughs> for our audiences out there, kind of give a little more in depth with who you help and how you help them and all that great stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've, you know, as you know, I've already said that I, I work mainly with expat wives or expat spouses, and I do include the military community as well, because that's very much, um, you know, a, a difficult situation when, you know, spouses are left behind when deployment comes around and especially when you have children. So I really work with them around, the mindset, you know, and, and bringing in mindfulness to, to help get you back to tap into your power again, to tap into your greatness and to tap into your, the ability to move, you know, process these feelings and, and move and overcome the, whatever it is, the resentment, the loneliness, the, um, the judgment, or, um, you know, how can I make this better for me? Right. So, I really um, just guide them through that, you know, through different mindfulness techniques um, and tips. And, you know, every, every client is different. So depending on what they feel, you know, their main challenge is, we work through that. And for however long that they need to, um, there's no, you know, really particular um, length, really. I mean, I say usually six to eight weeks that I work with my clients. But um, it's just, it depends. It depends on, you know, what they're going through, like I said, and, um, and their willingness, because they definitely have to be willing to, to move through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It takes two to tangle. It has to be trying to show it up does. and then it has to be the coach to support them. <laughs> and it, yes. starts, it starts with yes. them too, right? If they're ready and whenever they're ready. Mm -hmm. no. And right. can you tell our listeners where they can find you? Yeah, so I my they can find me on my site. It's mindfuljourneytofreedom.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, Angelique Ingram, and Instagram as well, Mindful Journeys. So I'm on Instagram all the time and on LinkedIn as well. And you can always just tap in, you know, say hi, yeah. you know, and you know, connect with me on whatever you know they you want to connect on. So I'm always there. Awesome. Awesome. What is one thing you would say to our listeners that they will never forget you about? Ooh. Put you on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Ron, those cookies are definitely gone. Uh -huh. <laughs> I bought just cookies with no walnuts in it. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. Just plain, plain cookie dough. Plain cookie yeah. dough. <laughs> no, honestly, I... I would say just live your truth, live in your truth, find yeah. the capacity to, to love yourself and give yourself enough compassion to just put everything else aside 
and do what you want to do. Do what you believe in and live your life in alignment with those beliefs and values that, that you hold. You know, um, life is too short. And so living in your truth is very important. Yes. That's all you got uh, to. You know, yes, you're so right. I'm so grateful. We're grateful that we've connected with you. You're such a wonderful you person. Oh, really uh, thank are. you. Likewise, <laughs> you guys are awesome. You guys are doing such a wonderful job. I love your podcast too, by the way. Thank it's, you. <laughs> thank you. And it was always how we started podcast is was we're doing some different things now. We're started so I want to tell this if we start a Facebook group life's a shuffle so all our episodes yes. are going to be listed there on Facebook and also we have purchased our own domain name www.lifesashuffle.com do not google Ooh. it now do not type it in it's, <laughs> it's not, not ready. quite ready yet <laughs> it's, in, it's in the process so we're getting it ready now so we can start our own website and uh we're lying with our purpose and doing what we stay sticking to we realize how far we've come I mean we're over almost 3,300 downloads. Um, we, our goal was this year to get a thousand, but consistency <laughs> sticking, the, the biggest thing people fail in life, uh, it could be business, friendships, marriages, whatever, is they don't stick to their why. And the why is not compelling enough. So our why is very strong, very compelling that we're going above and beyond just doing podcasts. We're doing the Facebook groups. We're launching our website. Now we're doing a live video. So because our why is so freaking strong, it keeps yeah. us and gives us energy. Um, so yes. we're, we're super duper excited about this. It really does. It really motivates us more to even keep doing this. Like there's no stopping us from doing this. I mean, this is one of the things I really, really, truly look forward to. Not just during our, our Freestyle Thursdays and then with the guests. And then, you know, even just having you here. Like I couldn't wait to have you here and have yeah. our listeners listen to your story. And I, I can't wait to forward this to Corey so she yeah. can listen oh, to it. You yeah. Know? Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you so much for the opportunity to because you know I, I try to as well, you know, especially with writing my book, I want to bring more awareness to the myositis yeah. community, you know, um, because it is a rare disease. And and I also want to let people know out there and not just in the expat community, but just in general, everybody yeah. is going through something. And we'll, yes. you have to be able to just um you know, if you need it, find the guidance and yeah. find the right guidance for you. Um, you know, you're not alone. Don't go it alone. No. You know, you got some people out there that know exactly how you feel. So, yeah. and this these is, two, yeah. these two <laughs> are great. Thank you. And this is one of the reasons why we created it. There the you go. I was about to say that. <laughs> yes. Because. Yes. Go ahead. No, you go first. Go, go, you go. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the, one of the reasons why I created, we created the podcast to let our listeners, we want to let everyone know, we want to make this impact that they're not alone, that somebody else is going through what you're going through, you know, and we understand, and that's what we're here for and why we also created, now we created the um, Facebook group is now we want our listeners to be engaged with us. We want to hear from you, Yeah. you know, and then so we can that's just- great. Yeah. Love it. You hit the nail around the head when you, Angelique, talked about a why story. That's why we get started. Um, it's, we're not different. Okay. We're new, we all are connected. And someone on this world is sharing your journey, Angelique. Could be somewhere in Africa, somewhere in Germany. It's someone sharing your journey. Just like the book you're talking about, Gone. She shared a different journey. Yeah, she's in a wheelchair, but she's different. So, so is sharing the frustrations and the empowerment and doing these different things. So that's why we started the Facebook group because now, we want people to interact, comment, you know, tell us something you yeah. want to discuss, bring up a topic. Um, you know, yeah. we, I can bring up so many, so many topics myself daily and write some of those things down, but comment, leave a comment. What would you like to discuss? If you want to be a, a special guest, we'll feature a special guest, but more importantly, I will answer your comment live on the air because you are part of this team. You're connected, you're part of this universe and you are freaking important. Yes. That's great. One more, th one more thing that. on that. Yeah. One more thing on that to add on to that is that this is also another way to connect to our guests, so connecting with our guests, because if someone else out there who's going through what Angelique went through, this is your chance to really connect with her and ask her questions and, you know, and just be connected with her. So that's another way too. Yeah, I'm ready. Way. I'm ready to connect. Connect yes. to create. I love we it. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to say thank you to our audience out there for listening. 
Um, this is a first live podcast, not live on Facebook, but definitely video. So we see yeah, each other. Yeah. Yeah. And this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach, mentor coach. And thank you for listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Yes. And besides the fluke that I did <laughs> earlier. <laughs> it happens. It was, you go. <laughs> no, this was a really, um, this was a wonderful experience. And thanks for um, joining us today on this, Angelique. And to that, cheers. Again, cheers. Hey, you. there's my glass ah, here. <laughs> cheers. Thank you again for um, joining us in another episode of Life's a Shuffle.